Welcome. My name is Kate Harmon, and I'm the Director of Cross-Campus Engagement for the Lundquist Center for Entrepreneurship. And today I'm really excited to have with us Ed Murr. Um, Ed is the CEO of Ben Business Advisors, um, and he's going to share with us a little bit about his 40-year uh, career in Silicon Valley with multiple technology companies. So welcome, Ed. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. I thought we would start off by having you uh, kind of give us a little bit of an overview of your early career, um, starting with your um, early years in college. I know you also um, had um, time in the Navy and, and kind of your early um, entry level jobs out of school. Okay, great. So <clears throat> I went to, I'm not a duck, but I did go to Purdue in engineering, mechanical engineering in the late 60s, early 70s, and got a bachelor's and master's in that. And those are the days of the Vietnam War, so I had a low draft number, so I decided to avoid going to Vietnam by becoming a naval officer and went to officer candidate school at Newport, Rhode Island. And um, when I was there, I was recruited by Admiral Rickover's team to come and teach, uh, actually in California at Maryland Island in a naval nuclear power school. And I did that for four years and um, mostly taught officers who went on board nuclear powered submarines and surface ships. And uh, after those four years, I was really itching to get into the business world. And um, I was also kind of overdosed on technology after doing it for so many years that I went into a sales and marketing position at Spectra Physics in Mountain View, California. And was an East Coast regional manager for them for, for, for actually two years there, then moved to Mountain View to be a product manager and then also a sales manager. And uh, after those six years at Spectra, I decided that I really was interested in early stage companies. So I started to get involved in startup companies and early stage companies, technology-based companies that, um, I guess we're certainly high risk, but also high reward in terms of uh, reward, not just financially, but just intellectually rewarding because they were more challenging than working for a 40 or 50 or $100 million company where things were more um, predictable, let's say. So I, I enjoyed the unpredictable nature of startup companies and the ability to you know, apply the smarts and the t to the technology and figure things out. So that's kind of where I got started. Well, you mentioned technology because um, one of the things that's so interesting with your background is that you've been involved with um, multiple different types of technology innovations over your career, ranging from solar to security to IoT. Um, can you name? Can you give us a little bit of um, a couple of companies or technologies that you helped develop and and that you were a part of? Yeah, there's, um, boy, there's a bunch of them. Um, it, uh, when I left Spectre Physics, I went to work for a company called Datatrack, um, and we developed some of the first uh, application-based uh, turnkey applications for PCs at that time, which were quite popular. And we did that for the construction industry. And um, one of the other, probably the one of the bigger technologies I developed, when I sold that company was I bought another company that was bankrupt that had started work on an electronic lockbox for the real estate industry. And we finished that product and I ended up sourcing a lot of the uh, materials from China at that time, which was kind of early in the stage of doing that in late eighties. And um, we sold that company to super products in Salem, Oregon, interestingly enough. And uh, they had tried, they had spent $5 million trying to do, what we ended up doing and they finally gave up and bought us. So that was an interesting one. Um, on the, some of the crazier stuff, like very early in biometrics, fingerprint sensors, I found a couple of guys inside Bell Labs when Lucent bought them and, uh, and brought out this silicon fingerprint technology, which everybody uses now in their computers and their phones. So we had done that in the mid nineties and, um, the interesting part of that is we had to develop a whole suite of software applications to make that worthwhile, which is a lesson in itself. You know, having just an underlying technology is one thing, but it has to do something. So the software applications were what really made that work. If you think about PCs, you know, the same thing happened with PCs when the early PCs came out in Lotus 1, 2, 3, and 
some of the other um, applications, <clears throat> database and word processing applications, really made that industry grow. And the same thing was true with biometrics. You needed a real application. A um, couple of other things, uh, did some digital certificate work, security software for fi secure financial transactions and medical care transactions. Again, one of the underlying themes of all this is there's a couple of things that you have to really remember with technology is it has to, you know, it's, it has to be at a certain price point that's accessible by large volumes of people. Um, when computers were $10,000, only certain people had computers. When computers were $1,000, you gave them to your kids. Um, so, you know, there's a price point at which technology makes sense. The other important price thing to recognize there is that uh, it's not just the technology, it has to do something. And so this gets into the what it is, what it does um, thing that a lot of people get confused about, particularly technologists when they talk about, you know, I've got this really cool technology and, and you know, it does this, that, and the other thing. And I saw a lot of those kinds of technologies come out of Stanford when I was in the Bay Area. and. Um, a lot of them didn't go anywhere because it didn't really do anything that was meaningful that people wanted to do. And so making that connection of something at a certain price point versus making something that was usable was where a lot of companies got in trouble. And frankly, a lot of companies failed at that time because they weren't able to make that connection with the end user. And that's such an important part. Well, let, let's talk a little bit more about that because I know that you, um, one of your um, skill sets is really being able to identify technologies and place them with the strategic market opportunities. So um, can you share a little bit more why you think identifying a market pathway is so critical for a technology that may not really have a clear market application? Yeah, this is probably my favorite question that I talk to people who, you know, are trying to get into start companies and so on. I, I always ask them, you know, tell me who your ideal customer is. If you can't identify who your ideal customer is, then you're going to have a real problem. I'll give you an example. Um, there's a technology that I was a little bit involved with coming out of Ohio State that was a technology for um, evaluating deficiencies or diseases of the eye and it was developed by a professor there and it, it was based on using an iphone or you know something with a really good camera to be able to look at the eye and tell what was wrong but it was very, using very expensive equipment this was kind of a do-it-yourself thing and what what where that company got into problem is they could not identify who their customer was. Was it the optometrist? Probably not. Or is it schools? I mean, there it, it really got confusing because, you know, they could never really figure out exactly who they needed to market that product to. And as a result, the company has really struggled and, and it probably get acquired by somebody else who has that idea and has is in that space. But on their own, they were never able to figure out, you know, who my ideal customer is. You know, with security software and security things like black boxes and digital certificates, it was pretty easy to really identify who the customer was. But, but there's one other part of that that makes it difficult, and that is people adopt a technology, consumers particularly adopt a technology slowly. Like when we first did uh, biometrics, it was pretty funny because, um, there was all kinds of articles written about that the biometrics would capture your fingerprint and send that to the FBI and so on and so forth. Well, that is an incredible demonstration of people having absolutely no idea how that thing actually worked. What really happens is your fingerprint creates a template that's unique to you and you cannot reproduce the fingerprint from the template and the template is the thing that basically provides the security. So, there's no way in the world putting your fingerprint on your computer or on your cell phone, the FBI could figure out what your fingerprint was. So, but people were very confused about that and there was a lot of pushback. And so there's sort of a social aspect to adopting technology that is another thing you have to be really careful for. And I've actually missed that more than, you know, I mean, it was, I was too early in biometrics and we did good things, but we were too early. And there's been a couple of other 
the things that I've looked at that really were the industries weren't ready for them. One was in the pharmaceutical industries with being able to use digital certificates for um, uh, basically uh, clinical trials and the industry wasn't ready for that and there was politics involved and so on. So it's confusing in that you really have, there's sometimes more aspects to this whole thing than you really realize, but you have to understand who your customer is, what their adoption rate is, what their hurt part is and um and what their want is and if you can't identify those things you're you're wasting your time you just need to figure that part out first and then the technology supports the need it's not the other way around great um our, my next question is sort of what are the kind of strategies or processes that you might use to help determine a market application for a technology um, product i mean you, you kind of mentioned some of it going out and talking to your customers was there any sort of specific framework that you use to help identify a technology to a market application? Um, I mean, I think you mentioned it. You know, you have to get in front of people and, and they, you know, they can't be your family and friends. They have to be people who are the skeptics, right? And so what I always tried to find was um, the customer or the potential customer who was most skeptical about the technology. and and work with that particular person to get through their discovery process of why the technology was good for them. We had a lot of this problem with lasers and for construction in the early days because a lot of the people we were selling to were maybe got out of high school. So, um, you know, they were very skeptical of technology and lasers and they thought it was gonna burn a hole in their skin and stuff like that, which is completely ridiculous. But to them, it wasn't ridiculous and so, I would always try and find, you know, the customer or the set of customers that were really um, skeptical and then also find early adopters, but early adopters are dangerous because early adopters are innovators and it's hard to build a business on a bunch of early adopters. It just doesn't work. I mean, it's great you sell a few to the early adopters, but then you hit that gap where you're trying to get to a much higher level and you don't get there. So, um, but basically it all involves getting out and getting in front of people who, who are hard cells or people who are early adopters. And then you kind of pull all that information together and, and figure out really what your marketing plan needs to be. But it involves the end user at the end of the day. Great. You know, if you don't have a customer, you're basically done. Great. Um, I know that you're a, a big proponent for companies adopting an unfair competitive advantage uh, to stay um, and get ahead. Um, how do you define unfair competitive advantage? And if you provide some examples from your career where you were able to apply an unfair competitive advantage in, in your company or, or job role? Yeah, that's one of my favorite things. So. Um... In technology, particularly, there are ways to have unfair competitive advantages. And so they can take several different forms. One on an obvious one is a patent or a series of patents. And so um, when I did my solar equipment company, we worked with some people at um, Lawrence Livermore Labs at Berkeley and uh, developed a unique ion implant device that we patented. We had several patents on that and several process patents on that that made it very difficult for somebody else to copy it. And there was a lot of also what I call tribal knowledge or secret sauce, which was really more methodology things that, you know, you, you can look at a patent, for example, but then you try to make the device work, but there's some things that they don't tell you, which we don't tell you, because that's really something you keep secret. It's like the, you know, it's like the formula for Coke. You know, why didn't Coke patent that? Well, for very good reason, because patents run out and everybody makes Coke. And so now they keep it locked in a safe in Atlanta and nobody knows how to make it except a few people. And that's worked well for them for over a hundred years. So, um, you know, that unfair competitive advantage can take the form of patents. It can take the form of know-how. Um, it also can take the form of being a fast mover in an early in a marketplace. Uh, Amazon's a good example of someone who, you know, what they're doing is really not all that unique. They're just an online marketplace, but you know, they've established a bunch of technology and support structure behind that. And they, they're so big that other people just don't want to compete with them because it just, it's, it's futile. You don't want to be 
a me too person in a marketplace. You don't want another brewery or another bicycle shop or something like that because it's too easy to copy and there's other people who are established. So, um, you know, this unfair competitive advantage, probably the best one I did was uh, a, a series of tests where I competed against RSA security with um, a bank on the East Coast to do secure financial transactions to commercial and to commercial customers like small, you know, restaurants and people like that who are they're transferring funds back and forth to the bank. And um, I asked the bankers, I said, well, how many, you know, users do you expect to have over time? And they said, well, more than a million. And so I just sort of smiled and said, well, okay, let's run a test and see who can support, you know, a lot of customers at the same time, because you don't want your system not to work. Um, so we did a, basically a bake off with RSA security and <clears throat> I had a mole inside RSA. So I knew they had a problem. Um, and, uh, and they got up to 10,000 users and their systems crashed and we got up over a million users and we were still going. So that pretty much killed that. So that is what I consider the, you know, the nuclear weapon of unfair competitive advantage. You know, we had something, we could do something they just flat couldn't do. And so, you know, the bank is obviously not going to make the choice. Uh, consequently, shortly thereafter, they called us up to try to acquire the company, which they ended up doing in the end. So. That's a good way to, it's a good exit strategy is to beat your competitor. <laughs> um, I know that you have worn multiple C-suite level um, roles and hats over your career from um, CEO uh, and including founder roles. Um, in many of these roles, you had to bootstrap um, to conserve resources. Um, can you share with us some of the instances where you had to resort to bootstrapping and, and some of the outcomes that came along with that? Yeah, I think it's the one thing that is the, the, probably the scariest part about startups or early stage companies is, you know, things don't go according to plan. And they always cost more and take longer and you have to scramble. And so being um, agile on your feet and, and creative makes a lot of difference whether or not you'll be successful. And, you know, bootstrapping, I mean, I have written personal checks to cover payroll for companies and time and again. Uh, you know, and that really, you know, you know, you're committed. It's like the story of the, you know, the, the pig and the chicken uh, at breakfast, the chicken is involved, but the pig is totally committed. So, um, you know, you're totally committed at that point that, you know, you're putting your own money into the company and you're making your own investments in the company. The other thing is <clears throat> it's, it's doing the non-obvious thing. Um, when you have, very limited funds you need to be clever about how you spend that money and you know there are some things that you can go do and you can go hire people to do and so on and so forth but sometimes you know you just have to figure out how to do it yourself because you can't afford to do it i think one of the problems and this happened oh in the last real silicon valley boom in the 2000 time frame companies had too much money and they would do really stupid things um, just to basically spend the money and to trying to, you know, get big fast, they wouldn't, they wouldn't, uh, use good business practices and spend money in, in an efficient way. And eventually they'll run out of money and then, you know, they've created a bad habit and they never get out of that bad habit. So being especially frugal and, and really being careful with how you spend your money and, and, and thinking through looking at alternatives to ways to do things as opposed to just go out and doing it. One other thing I will mention is that um, along those lines, and I tell companies this all the time, only do the things where you add value. You know, you don't add value by doing inventory or by, you know, keeping your, you know, QuickBooks up to date and, you know, get other people to do that. You know, when you have a PhD in physics and he's, you know, counting widgets in the back room, that's a bad mistake. So really focus on the things where you add value in the company and, and then outsource it to people who don't. When I did the solar equipment company, we only had five people. We had, I had three PhDs. I had a, uh, a lawyer accountant guy and myself, and we were able to grow that company and get it to the point where we could sell it and made a lot of money for our investors and ourselves. And um, everything I didn't need to do, I outsourced to other people because it was just a waste of our time. 
So that's really a critical thing. And so part of bootstrapping is, is really focusing on the things where you can make a difference in the company and, and, and outsourcing things where you don't make a difference. So get a lawyer, get a bookkeeper, use outside resources for things that, you know, that, that aren't really a good use of your time. That's great. Great advice. Um, as, as you look over your career, um, is there anything that you would have done differently um, as you look back? Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> hindsight is always, a, is, uh, I guess I've made enough mistakes that um, I became an expert at certain things. To, I think that's my definition of a technology expert. You make enough mistakes, you know what not to do. Um, I think uh, probably, you know, making, you could hire better people. So this is a mistake I think early stage people make a lot, especially kids coming out of college and they've got a great idea, they think, and so on and so forth. So, you know, they hire their best friend and they hire their brother or their sister or whatever. And, um, you know, you've got to really you've got to really bring good people around you and smart people around you, people who are smarter than you are, not necessarily smarter than you are, but are smarter in other areas than you are. You've got somebody who's much better at finance than you are, for example, or, you know, when I had SIT, when I was, I had, you know, PhDs and in, in uh, one of them was a CTO of applied materials and, and he was a very smart guy or is a very smart guy. And, you know, he knew, you know, how to really think through the technology issues much better than I could because he had that experience. So, um, you know, bringing better people in early helps. The other thing is, I wish I'd found better mentors earlier in my career than I'd found. You know, a lot of times you just kind of get a little bit arrogant with yourself and and you think you can do it. But, you know, there's a lot of smart people out there that can help you. And being able to take advantage of people who um, are more knowledgeable than you are and have more experience than you do in certain areas help you to avoid certain mistakes and, you know, getting off track because it's easy to do that. Uh, you fall in love with certain idea and then you don't have somebody who questions you. And, and so having a, a third party or a number of third parties to advise you and ask you the hard questions and make sure that you aren't doing the stupid thing or the wrong thing or the wasteful thing, um, is important. And so I guess if I look back, I mean, there were times when I wish I had better mentors and I had some better people and I've gotten rid of some people that I didn't really think were performing very well and replaced them with better people. I would say that I hate firing people, but I've never fired somebody and then regretted it. It's always, I was always able to get an upgrade. Um, so that's one of the things I learned sort of later or mid-career that um, made a difference later on that I wouldn't tolerate, you know, people who weren't really performing up to the standards that they should have been. And so, you know, those are the things you just learn as you go along, but it's good to have an outside person to advise you to say, Hey, why is that? You know, why is this person still around? I had one boss once who said to me, I had this one guy and who was working for me and he, I knew he was not up to speed. And I walked into my boss's office one day and, you know, he said to me, um, is uh, this guy still around? And I said, yes. And he said, well, some, some village is missing a perfectly good idiot. You need to get rid of him. <laughs> and, uh, and so, <laughs> so, I mean, he, you know, he, he was a very wise person and, and I've had him, had him on two or three boards that I was on and, and he was a good advisor and he would always, you know, he'd always ask the hard and embarrassing question that made you take action. And, I think, you know, that's a super valuable thing to have in your company, you know, rely on people who are smarter than you are, have better experience than you do, and are willing to disagree with you and ask you the hard questions. And I think that's something that a lot of entrepreneurs avoid because they just, you know, their ego gets get bruised, but you got to have a, thin, a thick skin to do this business. Otherwise, you know, you're just going to get into trouble. Nobody's that smart. I mean, there are a few people that are that smart, but but they're few and far between. I mean, the Zuckerbergs and the Steve Jobs of the world don't come along all that often. So um, there's a lot of people who just aren't at that same caliber, but need to be asked the hard questions. Excellent advice. Um, I, I guess what we'll, we'll do is we'll wrap up here with my last question. Um, for a, a student that's going to be going on the job market, 
um, and who may want to uh, follow a similar career path as you in Silicon Valley. Um, any kind of advice or best practices that you have for them? Yeah, um, well, I'd, I'd say, and I've told my kids the same thing too, they're all, you know, in, in the business world, except my, one of my son is still at the university. Um, go Who work. Who is a duck, right? Is, is a duck, yes, is a duck, yeah. And, and has been your student too, so. Um, <laughs> He has a little bit of entrepreneurial bent to that. Uh, um, find your passion. Find the thing you really love to do. Because, you know, starting a company and running a company and growing a company is hard. I mean, it is hard. You wake up in the middle of the night in cold sweats because, you know, you, you're worried about something. And it's painful. Um, but uh, find your passion. Also, get some experience ahead of time. Go, go work for a company that maybe is an innovative company and you know it's at a certain stage it's not at the very beginning stage but you can get some good basic knowledge about how things run because you don't know what you don't know so you just need to go and you know live the life for i i always you know i've told my daughter this i said you know to go work for a certain company for four or five years and get some really good experience and then if you want to go out on your own then i'm fine with that but until you get some experience and you know you start to learn what you don't know um, then you're wasting your time because you're going to make way too many mistakes. Really. So get some experience, find your passion. And, you know, while you're getting your experience, you can find that passion, whatever it happens to be. Because sometimes you surprise yourself. You do something that you, you know, all of a sudden you go, oh, my God, this is, you know, I want to do this the rest of my life. My life, excuse me. And, um, and it's not always an obvious thing. Uh, so figure that passion out. And then, you know, go find good people to work with, you know, good, build a team around yourself because, you know, that is so important. You can't do everything yourself. You can't possibly, you know, cover all the bases yourself. You need to get a good team, get a good mentor. And, um, and then, you know, take it from there because it'll, it'll make sure that you understand, like I said, you know, who's your customer, what unfair competitive advantage you can get in the marketplace. And, and then run with it and then just you know don't give up just play it out all the way that being said there are times you do give up because something just doesn't work for reasons that may not be within your own control so there are times to walk away but you know more often than not if you have a good idea and a good marketplace and a good technology and an unfair competitive advantage you can make it work but it is not simple and it is not easy and it is stressful as hell but at the end of the day you know um, it's worth it. One other thing I'll say too that I think I learned along the way is if you're focused on just making money or trying to get rich, that's the wrong focus. You, I've seen too many people fail when they had too much attention paid to the money and not enough attention paid to accomplishing something. So, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, studying for an exam. If you've done all your work ahead of time and you really well prepared the exam should be easy and the grade will come along you'll get your reward it's the same thing in in entrepreneurship and business you know do the basics do the right things you know and and don't worry about what your exit strategy is you know the vcs always say well what's your exit strategy well, you know i don't know well you know i'll either sell the company or i'll go public or you know or i'll fail <laughs> that's my exit strategy so um you know, don't be focused on the money. Don't get greedy. Uh, my brother on Wall Street always makes this comment about, you know, the, the pigs get slaughtered. He said, you know, the people who get greedy get slaughtered. And so, you know, that really applies to technology companies and startups too. Don't get greedy. Good things will happen if you do the work and you, you go through the basics and you give it your all. And, you know, things will work out. They just always do. Great. Thank you so much, Ed, for sharing your story and your advice with us today. I really appreciate it. Ed Murr is the um, CEO and of Bend Business Advisors. Thank you, Ed. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.